<laughs> they got it there. And while um, we'll be going through, we'd ask people to mute during the presentation. And if you want to turn off your video screens or leave them on either way, um, if you have questions during the program, please put them in the chat and we'll be monitoring that. And then um, Chris will be able to see them at the end and or if they're for the Conservancy, we'll be able to see those as well. So please just drop those questions in the chat. And um, after the program, we'll have our annual business meeting, which we promise to keep as uh, quick and zip through those business items as quick as possible. Um, and then if you have any extra time, we have a, a short and sweet um, video about the Conservancy documenting our work in honor of our 60th anniversary. So if you want, you can stick around for that at the end, but otherwise, um, we hope that the Conservancy members who are on the Zoom will participate in the business meeting and help us vote and elect in our um, incoming board members. So I think that's, I, I think I've gone through all of my um, small print that I needed to do to get us started. And it's 7.05, so I'll turn it over to Chris. I'm gonna take the prerogative of introducing Chris because he's, he's a guy that we need to know a little bit more about. Uh, he is senior biologist and Raptor project leader for New Hampshire Audubon. Um, and he's gonna share his insights with us tonight about the bald eagle in the Connecticut River Valley. And I, I have to say, in my experience, eagles have come so far due to, to the dedication of New Hampshire Audubon and others. 40 years ago, I worked for New Hampshire Audubon myself as a loon biologist and education director. And at the time, our staff mounted a memorable canoe trip to the far northern reaches of New Hampshire, to Malls Rock at Lake Umbagog, to witness the only eagle nest in the entire state of New Hampshire. And thanks in no small part to Chris's leadership, an adult eagle soared over my car as I drove home from work yesterday. For over 30 years, Chris has coordinated New Hampshire Audubon's many raptor and management projects to aid the recovery of bald eagles, also peregrine falcons, when I met him, and ospreys and northern harriers. Before landing in New Hampshire, Chris worked as a naturalist for Indiana State Parks, as a biotech for the National Park Service, ran a falcon release project at Isle Royale National Park in Michigan, and monitored eagles and other birds in southwestern Alaska right after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. He holds a Master of Science in Ecology and Behavioral Biology from the University of Minnesota. Chris started out wanting to be a forester, but was always distracted by the birds. And we're lucky he followed the feathers. So thank you for joining us tonight, Chris. I turn it there, over Thank to you me. so much. And I'm assuming you can hear me, right? Everybody can hear me? Yes. Um, thank you so much. I, I uh, appreciate the chance to talk to you and I will do my best to not take up all the time for your annual meeting so that you can get to your agenda. But I do have a lot to tell you about eagles throughout New Hampshire and some things specific to the Connecticut River Valley. I wanna say hello to several people that I recognize, some of whose photographs you might see tonight, including uh, Don Lacey and Jim Block, who I know are present, so thank you. And I'm going to uh, key up my PowerPoint and let's see if it, it comes up, okay? Let's see. So I have it up open on my screen. What do I have to do to get it onto your screen? There should be a green button on your Zoom platform that says share screen. Aha. Uh -huh. And then you yep. can pick which screen you'd like to share from. Yep. And it popped up, right? Did it pop up? Yep. All right, well, good, we're all set then. That's the hardest part of the show right there. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about bald eagle recovery in New Hampshire. I've been lucky enough to work with many, many uh, folks from all over the state in for the last 32 years uh, doing bald eagle recovery. And uh, 
this is a bird that everybody knows. Um, your three-year-olds can identify a bald eagle if they see one. Um, they're, they've been the symbol of the country for 200 years. Um, they're very easily recognizable and some might even say charismatic. Um, but you know, they, as well as many other uh, birds of prey, were really uh, decimated by the uh, uh, presence of DDT in our ecosystem beginning after World War II and through the 1970s. And so when the federal government created an endangered species list in the early 1970s, eagles were on the first list. And when New Hampshire Fish and Game uh, created our state's first endangered wildlife list in the late 70s, eagles were on that list then. Um, that's because we, as Adair said, we didn't have any um, nesting in the state at that time. And we hadn't since the 1950s. Um, flash forward 30 plus years, and uh, they came off the federal list in 2007. And in New Hampshire, we down listed them to threatened in 2008. And a decade after that, we actually removed them from our state's threatened list, which maybe you didn't know, but uh, they are no longer on our, our t and &E list in New Hampshire by virtue of their recovery. These guys are amazing. They live sometimes 20 to 30 years in the wild. Um, the oldest known eagle was 38 years old when it died, um, wild eagle. And that we know that from the band that was on its leg when it was found dead. Haliatus leucocephalus, that's the Latin name for bald eagle. It means white-headed sea eagle, which alludes to the fact that these guys are water-based birds. They don't swim around in the water very much, but they do make their living from creatures that are in the water and they often nest very close to water. Uh, tomorrow, eagles will be doing this in New Hampshire, I have no doubt, flying through the snow. Um, they get along just fine in the winter in our state. Our breeding eagles don't even have to migrate out of the state in the winter. They stay put pretty much year round near their nest sites. And although they'll congregate in a place like Great Bay where there's food available and they'll be uh, mostly looking for fish and other aquatic things. Uh, it, I think this one's going into his mouth, not coming out. Uh, they are fish eaters, but they're also generalists. And besides fish, they eat lots of birds, including ducks and geese, as well as gulls and great blue herons and mammals, a lot, a number of mammals, surprising number of mammals, including muskrats. This is a picture taken at uh, um, Reed's Marsh in Orford uh, with an eagle standing on top of a muskrat den. I'm not sure if it's waiting for a muskrat or if it's picking up scraps that a, an otter might have left on top of that uh, mound. But uh, they are definitely um, food generalists. They eat all kinds of things. They, while they focus on our rivers and lakes and other tidal areas and they prefer aquatic prey, um, they, uh, they um, also, um, the uh, younger birds are ones that you might not immediately recognize as a bald eagle. The classic white head and tail doesn't come till the birds are three or more years of age. So these two birds in this picture, uh, the one on the left with the dark brown eye is a one-year-old eagle, uh, whereas the one on the right with the yellow eye and the slightly yellowing beak is a two-year-old eagle. Um, neither has that classic white head and tail pattern that you might expect. Um, and these immature plumages, which vary greatly in terms of the, uh, whether they have lots of white or mostly dark or tan color, bleached out, things like that, they really do serve as pretty good camouflage in our winter months, especially uh, against the backdrop of, uh, of, of deciduous trees without leaves. Um, oftentimes they can be mistaken this time of year for another eagle that you have your best chance of seeing in the state in the month of November, and that is golden eagles. Uh, if you saw this eagle, Adair, as you're driving down the Connecticut Valley looking, going to going to shop in West Lebanon, um, you might say, oh, that's gotta be a bald eagle, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, especially this time of year. Um, 
picture was taken 500 yards outside of New Hampshire, up north of Errol, uh, with a camera trap uh, of an adult golden eagle eating a, a food item that's set out in front of the camera trap. Um, this is an adult golden eagle with a very different plumage than bald eagles. That uh, yellow mane on the back of his head, um, the legs with feathers all the way down to the toes, and, uh, and that's that's uh, something that you do not see on bald eagles. They have naked legs, yellow skin showing instead of feathers on their legs. And immature goldens have, uh, I, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not here, they have these white patches on the underside of their wings and a white stripe at the base of the tail, um, which uh, tells you that they are a one or two year old or even a juvenile golden eagle. Now golden eagles migrate more than bald eagles do in this part of the country. And we get them in transit coming from the nearest known breeding areas, which are in the Gaspe Peninsula and further north in Quebec. And they're transiting down to the Appalachian Mountains in Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and that area. So it's possible right now to see a golden eagle, especially in uh, the kind of weather we're having now. This is this is tells them it's time to migrate when we get into the sub-freezing weather. Going back to balds real quick, um, I said they progress in their plumage from all brown to uh, finally the white head and tail. This guy's probably three years old, just starting to see some white in the head and maybe a little in the tail. The following year, that bird might look like this, white with a little bit of dark left in the, in the head. Also, the beak has got a little dark still on it. The tail probably has some dark spots like, like this one does here. This could be a five-year-old bird, but by the time they're five or six, they mostly have the classic full adult white head and tail. Um, our eagles are not easily mistaken for ospreys. They are much bigger than ospreys. They occupy a higher position in the food web. By that, I mean, Ospreys catch a lot of fish, but if an eagle comes along and wants it, the ospreys have to um, give up their food or face the consequences. And I'm actually surprised this, this osprey still has some a piece of food fish in his talons because he is in great jeopardy at this point in this picture. One thing that some people don't know about bald eagles is they are also scavengers. And especially in the winter months, they spend a lot of time cleaning up the things that in the summer, a turkey vulture uh, flock would, would clean up. So uh, they um, encounter uh, food, uh, mammals and things killed by predators, um, things killed by bad weather uh, or vehicle collisions with, with animals uh, on the roadside, which is um, actually kind of an eagle's Achilles heel is Scavenging along highways is um, not a wise uh, way to get your meal, but a lot of eagles do that, and they run the risk of becoming uh, uh, hit by vehicles uh, in the process of picking up that food. Um, you're more apt to see our eagles in the winter than you are in the summer in most places because they perch so often in deciduous trees along rivers, and without the leaves on the trees, they're more visible, sometimes in heavily trafficked areas. Um, they focus on our major rivers like the Connecticut, the Androscoggin, the, and the Merrimack in the winter months because those areas keep uh, open water most of the winter. And uh, that brings in a lot of water based animals that concentrate there and uh, give eagles more food items to choose from. Um, in the winter months, especially, eagles will roost in groups. Um, they uh, have identified places that have good thermal cover, and they will gather in numbers. Sometimes five, six, seven, ten, even fifteen will gather in the same clump of trees. A uh, place that has a has shelter from the northwest wind, has a lack of overnight disturbance, and in the morning at first light, they'll trek out of there. The experienced birds will go to where the food is and all the inexperienced ones will follow them. Uh, so there's some social learning that goes on as a result of that winter act roosting activity. 
an example of one of these winter roosts would be on Great Bay in the southeastern part of the state. Uh, a spot that has exposure to the morning sun like this east facing shoreline with big pine trees to roost in uh, where your back as an eagle, your back is to the prevailing northwest wind, a place that has uh, thermal cover and is close to food. That's the kind of place where um, that might become an eagle roost site. And also, I, as I mentioned before, a spot where there isn't a lot of overnight disturbance that would cause them to flush out of those trees and have to look for a less than optimal place to spend the night in those cold, long days that are coming in the next few months. Uh, places like this, we work with the New Hampshire Fish and Game to identify and uh, this particular wildlife management area at uh, Wilcox Point actually is close to public use for four months in the, in the winter months. The only state wildlife management area that has a seasonal closure uh, to public use, and that's to protect the roost site for eagles. Now, until 2020, for 40 years in a row, New Hampshire Audubon coordinated New our state's midwinter eagle count. Uh, that was a statewide count essentially on one day where we got anywhere from 10 to 100 people to go out in one day, split up the state into pieces and see how many eagles we could find. And if you go back to the early years of the count in the 1980s, we were lucky to find five to 10 eagles statewide on that one day count, as you can see down here. Um, the white parts of the bars are adult eagles. The brown parts are those brown immature eagles. And then you can see that our population in the winter months, at least on this one day midwinter count, has been climbing quite steadily. Um, not every year is the same. Some years the weather interferes with our count. Other years uh, seem to be perfect for the count. But um, we finally um, backed off doing this count in 2020. That was our last uh, January count that we did. And uh, we were just, we were fortunate to actually smash the century mark that year. That season, that, that day, we counted 101 uh, bald eagles on the one day count statewide, including, I'm guessing this, um, probably about 25 of them were on the Connecticut River. So um, I'll show you a slide later that shows how dense our eagle population is on the Connecticut. Um, eagles uh, pair up, find territories, stay in those territories throughout the um, year and uh, um, pair up for breeding, which begins actually even in late January, there's courtship going on and mating uh, in these sites. They, uh, what, they look for spots that have all the components of their, of their um, annual cycles, things they need in the winter, spring, summer, and fall, including secure trees to build nests in. And when eagles build nests, um, they, they work hard at it. Um, they use good sized sticks for these nests. And I've got to show you this next picture. I've never seen anything that matches this one. This is not Photoshopped, I'm telling you. This is a newfound lake, and it's an eagle with about a 14 foot pine branch that it must have picked up from the shoreline. And it's struggling to keep that in its talons and drag it to its nest tree. Um, I'm no, not sure what it would do if it got to the nest tree because eagle nests are six, seven feet wide, not 14 feet. I don't, I don't know where it would put that stick, even if it got it there. Um, they build giant stick nests and they add to them every year. Um, they get deeper and deeper and heavier and heavier over time. They like super canopy trees that are higher than all the other pine trees in the neighborhood. Oftentimes they're right on the shoreline or which gives them access in and out of the nest. Um, they'll use them multiple years. Sometimes they'll have alternate nests that they use as insurance in case the tree that their primary nest is in blows down just before it's time to lay eggs. And they do maintenance of their nests year round. And in fact, in November and December, when our day length is a lot like it is in February and March, which is their breeding season, uh, 
their hormones tell them they should be nest building because of this similar day length. And so you, you can see eagles at nests that you might know about working on their nests right now. It's the time of year that they are actually rather busy at nests. Some of these nests are in beautiful, tranquil locations. Um, others are right above busy lakefront houses. You can see in this picture, the tallest super canopy pine right above that cabin has a nest. Um, right above the, the deck where people hang out day and night. And it's so close, in fact, that the bald eagles, when they're on their nest, actually poop on the house. <laughs> That's what the white is here. So um, they there's no reason why they can't nest close by as long. I mean, remember, they're 80 feet up in the tree with very little view down. They're looking up and out. And as long as um, there's no undue disturbance, um, they they can uh, manage in places like this. It's actually something we didn't know until we had a lot of eagles in the state. We realized they actually are not as sensitive as one might think in terms of their tolerance of normal activity. And as I said, eagle breeding season starts early. I've got a series of pictures here of mating. I just wanna show you, um, it's sometimes hard to tell who's the big one and who's the small one. The small eagle is the male. Um, uh, sometimes the pair are, are very close in size, oft, but oftentimes the female is considerably bigger. Um, hard to tell here because the, the branches are not at the same distance from the camera, but I'm just gonna show you this sequence of shots. Uh, mating does not occur, occur in midair. It occurs on a perch like this branch, rarely on the nest, usually some other exposed spot and lasts about 10 seconds. And they'll, they'll go through the mating process many times in January and February. Um, and then by the time we get to the end of February, they start laying eggs. Takes them uh, 35 days to incubate their eggs once they lay them. They'll lay one to three eggs. Um, most of our eagles have to uh, contend with at least one major snowstorm while they're incubating their eggs. They need to keep them warm day and night. And if it snows a foot, so be it. The eagle has to sit there. And you can see in this lower picture why it's important that they stay put. Because if they leave the nest, the snow would surround the eggs, the eggs would chill, and the embryos would die. But if they continue to sit on top of the eggs that whole time, that spot never gets snow on it and uh, they can continue to, the eggs can continue to develop without being chilled as long as the adults continue to warm them. If we lose an adult during incubation, the nest almost always fails. And that's because they take turns on the nest and the one who's away from the nest is doing all its other things like eating, bathing, all the rest, while the other bird takes care of the eggs. So it's a team effort, definitely. This is what eagles have to contend with when they nest in February or March in New Hampshire. Uh, I'm gonna show you a second picture of this very same nest. This is an incubating nest with an <laughs> eagle behind the snow pile. Um, and uh, again, this is what they have to contend with as well as the 40 mile an hour winds and the wind chill and everything else. So eventually the snow does melt by April, hopefully. And uh, the eagles are still at it. But by, by uh, the time they hatch in April, usually it's warmed up. Their, their posture, they get a little higher in the nest. They get more sun. The leaves start to pop out. And uh, hopefully we get some warm spring weather when the eggs have hatched. Um, eagle chicks are in the nest for 11 to 12 weeks from the time they hatch. Most of our pairs have hatched by the end of March, which means they're still exposed to some cold weather. In the first couple weeks, they have to be kept warm by the adults because they cannot warm themselves uh, at that point. They can't thermoregulate. Um, New Hampshire Audubon and Fish and Game have worked 
uh, to document where nests are located in the state, to document whether they hatch or not. And then sometimes when the chicks are six to eight weeks, we, we visit the nest to uh, inspect the chicks, occasionally draw blood samples for contaminants, uh, put ID bands on the chicks if we're going to do that, um, and to make sure everything is, is good with the nest and the nest tree. Um, as I mentioned, they're all hatched by April, and uh, um, they're definitely hatched by May, and they have to be kept warm for a couple weeks. We do see losses, both from predation and from shortages of food and weather, and they're in that nest, unable to fly for 11 to 12 weeks. Um, I'll go back. This, these chicks in this nest are about five weeks of age, maybe six. Uh, in the following picture, they are more like 10 weeks of age, and they're beginning to exercise and flap hop, and helicopter is another way to put it. Working those wings, getting some strength in the wings, and actually lifting off the nest in order to uh, uh, exercise. They do this for several weeks before they um, start flying. But sometimes the, the first flight is accidental. If, if this bird gets airborne and a gust of wind comes along, when she comes back down, she might not be over the nest anymore. She might come back down in, in the air. And then whether she likes it or not, she's flying. And some of our young eagles end up out of the nests and on the ground uh, several weeks before they're actually capable of flying. If that's the case, the adults will continue to feed them if they know where they're at. And as long as they're not vulnerable to predators, um, they might still manage to survive. And in fact, get back to the nest eventually. We try to protect some of these sites that are particularly vulnerable with um, um, signage or floating signage, depending on the location. Each of these things takes great effort to maintain throughout the season. So we are very careful about whether we really need to do this at most sites. And as our population has grown, uh, the percentage of nest sites that get this sort of treatment has become less and less. But there are some places where the eagles are quite a draw. And on the weekend, everybody wants to come out and take their grandkids to see the eagles. And that's wonderful, but you, you do need to leave, leave the birds some distance um, and definitely don't get out on these islands or shorelines and walk around under the nest. From, besides disturbance, it also leaves a scent trail that um, mammals that use scent like raccoons will follow thinking they can get some food by following human scent. So uh, I caution everybody about walking around under eagle nest trees, uh, especially during the active season. Our management goals have been for years to get as many young eagles out and fledged as we can each year. And um, this, is, this is the max. Three chicks in one nest is the most we can, we've ever seen in New Hampshire. Um, based on uh, all the years of data, only about 5% of all the successful eagle nests produce three young to the age of fledging. Um, a lot of them hatch three, but they don't all make it if there's any food shortage. Other things that we do include working um, to Predator proof the nest trees. I wonder if anybody recognizes a local Upper Valley resident here. Um, recently retired from Vermont Fish and Wildlife. This is John Buck, who is a neighbor of all of yours, I believe. Um, uh, we're actually at a nest on the, on the Vermont side of the Connecticut River, uh, north of Walpole in this picture, um, in Rockingham, Vermont. Uh, putting a sheet metal flashing guard around this cottonwood tree to keep raccoons and fishers from climbing it. Oftentimes we'll put uh, camouflage guards. We'll put the guard on and then we'll spray paint it uh, because uh, those sheet, that sheet metal is so reflective and it actually draws people's attention to the site. But really it's surprising how uh, um, spray paint on a, on a sheet metal predator guard will cause the guard to disappear into the woods. Uh, here's another predator guarded tree. Um, if you weren't looking for it, you probably wouldn't notice that that uh, predator guard was even there. Um, idea is to keep these tree climbing mammals from getting up into the nest. And we've seen over time, 
a much greater nesting productivity out of guarded trees than unguarded trees. Another management step that we take and have taken in the past more than we do now, again, with so many eagles to monitor. Um, when we had fewer pairs, we were very interested in obtaining um, blood samples to see what the contaminants were like in these young birds and to put ID tags on as many as possible. We oftentimes work with a group called Biodiversity Research Institute out of uh, the Portland, Maine area. Um, we'll bring the eagle chicks to the ground in a duffel bag or some other box-like item uh, where we can work on them safely. And uh, if you don't restrict an eagle chick and you just let it sit there, oftentimes it thinks it's still in the nest. It behaves the same way. And uh, if, you, if you hold them, they struggle, but if you just let them sit there, they do just fine. So we'll measure, um, take measurements on these birds and uh, we'll put uh, ID bands on them, uh, like these black color bands that are, that are unique and specific. Um, and uh, those, they have contrasting simple codes on them that uh, someone with a spotting scope or even binoculars or a good camera can get pictures of and we can ID those birds later, sometimes years later uh, with those bands. Um, this is an example coming up here. Uh, this is a, about a six or seven week old eagle chick with the code letters B over B, although it's upside down because I'm holding the bird's legs up. Um, we hope that we'll see these guys again later, hopefully even at nest sites. Um, they, they stay dependent on the adults for food even after uh, they have fledged from the nest, oftentimes for a month or two. August, September, even into October, they may still be trying to get food from the parents and the parents may be still feeding them occasionally. A lot of these young birds die in their first year of life, unfortunately, but uh, the parents take good care of young eagles even after they've left the nest. I think this is probably an August picture of uh, an adult feeding its two chicks, even though the chicks are as big as the adult now, they're still relying to some degree on the parents for uh, providing food. And remember that uh, picture of the young bird I was holding, the B over B? Uh, two years later, we received this picture from New York State of the very same eagle chick, again, B over B, as a two year old uh, flying around, I believe it's Lake George. Uh, since that time, we have not received another report of this bird anywhere. I don't know if this guy's made it or not. I'm hopeful that next spring, somebody will find B over B breeding somewhere in New England. Um, it could be New Hampshire, it could be New York, it could be someplace else. But you can see that these codes are really contrasting codes that allow us to get a lot of information back from photographers, especially. Back to the Connecticut Valley uh, in Orford uh, and Fairley, we have had for many years a nesting pair that has bounced back and forth between the New Hampshire and Vermont sides of the river. Um, and this bird here, a um, photographer named Jeb Forbush, took this shot a number of years ago now of this gold banded eagle, kindly holding his leg band out for, our, 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 uh, cam for Jeb's camera. And when you zoom in, you could, we could actually read the code on his band, WP2. That um, bird was banded at the southern end of the Connecticut River in New Hampshire in, in uh, Hinsdale as a chick, managed to find its way all the way up to Orford. And the last time we saw the male at this nest, it was still this guy about three years ago. He's probably still a member of that breeding pair in Orford. And uh, we've gotten a number of pictures over the years of WP2, uh, the male eagle. Um, at that, at that nest site. So anyway, I really, I just wanna shout out to the wildlife photographers or even just ordinary people who take uh, high resolution images of wildlife uh, when they encounter it. Because um, a situation like this where you bump into an eagle um, feeding his young on the shoreline, and even when you scare it away, that, whoop, wrong one. 
that bird, when it flies away, if you keep snapping pictures, you just might get the code, as is the case with this main banded red band, three over U. Um, again, um, and if you don't take the pictures, we can't get the data. So if you do get any shots like that, um, please uh, share them with us because uh, that's how we get a lot of our, our band sightings on where these birds end up. Um, our list of collaborators is long. We've worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and New Hampshire Fish and Game, many, many, many volunteers over the years. This uh, research group called Biodiversity out of Maine, as I mentioned before. A lot of these nests are on private land, so we work with local landowners or managers of public land like state parks. Um, research labs are involved in a lot of the samples that are collected and funders like the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Remember TransCanada? <laughs> they funded us for five years in the work we did in the Connecticut River Valley, a group called the Door Foundation and actually several others are, have all been helpful to sustaining our efforts. Now, I wanna give you a little update on the status of, of, of our population now. We really have focused on breeding birds for most of the last decade, less so on our wintering birds. But I just want to mention that as of this past summer, we were up to uh, 92 territorial pairs of bald eagles in New Hampshire. Now, that doesn't include a pair nesting on the Fairley side of the Connecticut River or in Wilder, because that's Vermont. So this is strictly New Hampshire birds, 92 nests in territorial pairs and 72 active nests in New Hampshire. 51 of those were successful in, in 2022, and we had a record high 84 young produced. Um, that's, those, those are outstanding numbers. I just wanna move on quickly because it's much easier to see this way. Here's the history of our breeding eagles in New Hampshire. And you see Adair was mentioning how there was only one nest in Northern New Hampshire in the late 1980s. And that was true for a decade until the late 1990s, there was only one known breeding pair of eagles in our entire state. And it was barely in New Hampshire. If it had been half a mile to the east, it would have been in Maine. In any case, um, it took a while for the um, growing population to catch traction. And actually it benefited from increasing populations in some states that surrounded us, Massachusetts and Maine and New York in particular, their populations caught hold sooner than ours did. And Vermont and New Hampshire were late to the game. As the population expanded, New Hampshire and Vermont were um, spots they could move into, and they did. The 2000s um, saw an increase in our uh, number of eagle pairs. And what I want to point out here, as soon as I can figure out where my cursor is, there it is, is the steady rate at which this population has been going up since about 2010. The slope has been um, pretty much the same all this time. Um, and the big question here is, when will we fill up all the uh, available breeding territories for bald eagles in our state? We've gone from uh, 20 eagle pairs in 2010 to we're approaching 100 eagle pairs now. We may well hit 100 next year. And if we keep going at this rate, we'll have 200 eagle pairs in New Hampshire in 2030. Now, my training as a biologist says, this curve is gonna to start to flatten out and we're gonna see it plateau at some point in the, in the relatively near future. Uh, but we keep finding eagles moving into territories between other pairs where it didn't seem possible there could be another pair. Good hard look at the Connecticut River in this um, map. The, Red triangles are nests actually physically located in New Hampshire. The blue ones are located outside of New Hampshire. So on the Connecticut River, those are nests located in Vermont, but they're all on the river. Look at the density of the eagle population from, let's say from Lebanon here, this is Mascoma Lake right here. So you get an idea where we are. Look at the density from there south to um, north of Keene. Incredible. And they keep squeezing in between new pairs moving into those open spots. And 
unless there's something different about the Connecticut River in Piermont and Orford and in that area, it seems to me that we're going to find new pairs in places like uh, right here, um, south of the Ampampanusik, um, and north of there, uh, up into Haverhill and that area, some places where there's still gaps. Um, just look at the state map here, though. Um, eagles have basically taken over Lake Winnipesaukee. Uh, what a cluster of eagle pairs in Winnipesaukee and the surrounding lakes. Just amazing. Um, now in southeastern and south central New Hampshire, they're much more widely scattered. But you can even make out the Merrimack River here, where we have five pairs between Concord and Franklin. So in the one big empty spot, everybody knows what this is, right? The mountains. Bald eagles are not mountain dwellers. Golden eagles are. And with very few lakes in the mountains, uh, it's not surprising we have fewer birds there and no, no territories yet discovered. But in any case, just incredible the density of eagles on the Connecticut River now, looking at both New Hampshire and Vermont. And that's a map from 2021. I don't have one for this year. We have several new pairs on the Connecticut River this year to add to that list. So they're now delisted in New Hampshire. They've kept, been off the list for almost five years now. We um, continue to monitor them, though, because they can tell us a lot. Um, speaking of pairs moving into places, this is an osprey platform in southern New Hampshire with an eagle pair nesting in the osprey nest. Uh, at Umbagog, back in the 1980s, that you could see four or five or six osprey nests from one spot on the lake. Now there are five eagle pairs nesting on Umbagog, and you cannot find an osprey pair visible from on the lake. You have to go back into the swamps and marshes several miles from the lake to find nesting ospreys. They still come to the lakes, the big lakes, to feed, but they don't hang around because their nests are subject to being raided by eagles. So they nest far away from the lake and have to transit further distances with their food. With our population increasing and the fact that eagles do eat roadkill, we end up with situations like this on the interstates where roadkill deer are scavenged by eagles. And if they're not careful and they fly into traffic, they can be struck by vehicles too. This is an eagle that has been hit by a vehicle and cannot fly. Um, we work with Maria Colby and other wildlife rehabilitators to rehabilitate a number of eagles each year. Uh, Maria has been at this business for more than 30 years in Henniker, New Hampshire, Wings of the Dawn is her uh, operation. Not only young eagles, but adult eagles as well come into her shop and um, she does her best to uh, get them back in condition that they can be released to the wild. It's not always the case that they can. Uh, last fall, a fishing game officer picked an eagle up in uh, uh, Cornish, New Hampshire. That's this uh, adult eagle in this fishing net, couldn't fly. Um, that bird went to Maria Colby, uh, spent a year there, and we released it, I, I guess it was two years ago, we released it this last year uh, back to the Connecticut River again. Um, when, it, when the birds are ready to go, we'll bring them back to, the, to a spot that's suitable, open up the box, let the bird fly off on its own with an ID band on it so that we can find it again. Or if it gets in trouble again, we know it's the same bird that got in trouble and uh, can act accordingly. Um, uh, I, if you haven't been present at a bald eagle release, it's something to try to do. Uh, I know that uh, Vins, uh, has done a number of those in the Connecticut Valley, and um, an opportunity to join them for one of those releases is always worthwhile. Um, so I'm, I'm going to wrap up here. I don't have much more to tell you, and I know your meeting's coming up. Um, I just want to actually, I, I, had a, I added a couple more pictures in for just for you guys. Um, I don't suppose any of you know where this spot is. This is um, a nest that you can see from behind Home Depot in West Lebanon. But this picture is taken from the Vermont side of the uh, river. 
And in this, this, this is this year's, uh, no, it's not this last year's shot of the nest. Um, three eagle chicks in that nest a couple of years ago. Um, the site is, uh, has been um, very successful over the past half decade but a tough one to monitor. It's hard to get a good look at it, unless you're on the, on the river paddling that stretch below the I-89 bridge, which is not the easiest stretch to paddle, by the way. Um, we're continuing to work hard to document how many young birds are produced every year. We're continuing to do what we can to maximize the productivity. Um, maybe we ought to slow down on that because we have so many pairs now. But uh, at some point, the eagles will tell us when their population has filled in all the spaces available to them. We don't have any good data from the 1920s or earlier to tell us how many eagles there used to be. We've only got um, what we've got in front of us now to tell us when we've, um, we've satiated the, uh, the space in New Hampshire. Um, I gotta show you this one though. This is not the Connecticut River Valley, but last year I thought I'd seen it all until the folks at Bow Lake produced pictures of an eagle chick side by side with a red-tailed hawk chick in the same nest. And we're all scratching our heads and going, how in the world could a red-tailed hawk chick be in that nest and not be eaten by eagles? Um, the only thing we could come up with was that it did come in as a small prey item after it hatched in a red-tailed hawk nest an eagle male most likely collected it and brought it back to feed its young. But when it arrived at the nest, it must have done some food begging calls and the other eagle at the nest chose to feed it rather than eat it. And in fact, that young red-tailed hawk grew up to be a fully feathered young red-tailed hawk and fledged from the nest at about the same time as the young bald eagle did. Uh, in July of 2021. Um, no word yet on whether that young red tail preferred fish in its diet as opposed to squirrels. But um, this is one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen, um, documented again by volunteers who just were alert to what they were seeing and continued to follow it till, till that young bird fledged. It's only been documented a handful of times anywhere in North America, including several times in British Columbia, I believe on a nest with a, a game cam on it, where you could actually follow the daily activities of, of the red-tailed hawk and the eagle chick. Um, we didn't have that luck in New Hampshire, but we did have a remote camera on it to, to, to follow it. So anyway, I just thought I'd bring that up because you never know what you're gonna see next with, with these birds. They are truly amazing. And we continue to follow these birds because they tell us a lot about our food web and our ecosystem. Um, eagles eat a lot of fish and people love to eat fish, but if there are toxins in the fish that are affecting eagles, that's a warning to us that we need to be worried too. And so um, we have to continue to follow these high level predators because they do give us some insights as to what's going on in our environment. Um, especially in our aquatic systems. So I think I'm going to stop there. Um, Adair, I'm not sure what the best next move is here, but uh, no, I do want to thank especially all the wildlife photographers whose pictures appeared in this show. Without that, I wouldn't have anything to show you. Um, we've got an amazing group of people over the years who've helped us document these birds. And also a lot of great collaborators, as I've mentioned before, I need to update this slide because what was TransCanada became Great River Hydro, and now it's not even Great River Hydro anymore. They've changed again. So uh, um, anyway, I, I, that, that's neither here nor there. But uh, thank you for uh, your attention. I know I went long, and I apologize for that. No apologies necessary. Chris, that was extraordinary. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat, and I bet more will occur to people. Um, as, uh, as we go ahead. Uh, the first is what might constitute an overnight disturbance? An overnight disturbance at uh, these um, midwinter uh, roof sites is what I'm, I'm referring to there. 
Um, mm -hmm. A bunch of teenagers partying underneath an eagle roost tree. Um, a group of coyotes gathering underneath an eagle nest tree. Um, um, a place that people could drive to uh, would likely be disturbed by vehicles and headlights. So mm -hmm. these guys have to pick spots um, and they do it trial and error. They pick spots and they use spots that have a history of not being disturbed in, in the middle of the night. And again, as I said, the reason for doing that is because you don't wanna be flushed out of your roof tree at three in the morning on a blizzard night when it's five degrees above zero and have to find another place to perch, probably without any other eagles shoulder to shoulder with you to keep you warm. So uh, that's that's why it's such an important thing that these sites be um, safeguarded in, in many ways to uh, allow them to um, get through the winter in really good shape so that when breeding season rolls around, um, they're in good condition. Okay. Uh, Kate appreciates the um, sharing of nest duties. Um, any any mom around here does appreciate that same thing. Um, Heidi wants to know if eagles are still federally listed, and are other parts of the country experiencing the comeback like New England is. The bald eagle was removed from the federal list of endangered and threatened species in 2007. So it's been more than a decade they've been off the federal list. And states had the um, authority to keep them on their state list if they had greater concerns in, uh, in their state at that time. Uh, so I don't know if I'm fully answering that question for you. Uh, we felt that our birds had recovered sufficiently and the trajectory of population growth was such that we could remove them from our state list uh, five years ago. And in that map that I showed you earlier, I'm not going to go back to it now, we've now divided the state into five units. And our objective is to focus on one of those five units every year for five years um, and rotate around the state over that five-year period. That's simply because getting to all these nests is becoming more and more of a challenge uh, in the breeding season. The only way we can continue to get data on all our nests is if we have lots of volunteers who live in those local areas who can go out and monitor specific nests. And I'll just mention, if there's anybody here who hasn't been involved before and wants to get involved, uh, I'm happy to talk to anybody about how you could get involved in monitoring uh, an eagle nest somewhere in the Connecticut Valley. We don't need five people monitoring the same nest every day, but it's great to have people assigned to each nest so that if something happens, uh, we're aware of it ahead of time. So, uh, you know, you can reach me at cmartin at nhaudubon.org. Um, I'm sure that information is available in a way you can get to it. Or just uh, contact uh, New Hampshire Audubon and ask to talk to the Eagle guy. Uh, Erica wants to know what age, um, at what age do eagles breed? Uh, usually they are setting up territories as three or four year olds just when they're starting to get the white head and tail. Um, some eagles actually are involved in egg laying or breeding attempts when they're four-year-olds. Oftentimes those are not successful, they're inexperienced and they, they goof up. They do things that aren't um, encouraging of su nesting success. Uh, but by five and six years of age, uh, oftentimes um, most of our eagles are breeding at that point. It's rare for them to go seven or eight years and not be involved in a breeding attempt. Uh, and are there any eagle cams in New Hampshire? Currently, there are no active bald eagle cameras in our state. I've been actually asking that question because we're hoping to do some work with uh, uh, school kids in the spring that involves monitoring eagle cams like we've done with peregrine falcons. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, there are probably a handful, maybe five or six good cameras in the Northeast, in places like Pennsylvania, Washington, DC, and a few other sites. I don't know of any in Maine, uh, Vermont, or Massachusetts currently that would be suitable. I'm gonna try to set something up in the next year or two at a site in New Hampshire, but as it stands right now, there aren't any. But 
um, there are some fantastic Eagle cams in other parts of the country that give you, no pun intended, a bird's eye view of what's going on. Okay. Um, and how many golden eagles travel through our area? Hard to say. Our hawk watch counts close to a dozen each fall of the hawk watch at Pac Monadnock down in uh, mm -hmm. near Peterborough. Mm -hmm. um, there, uh, most of the migration of golden eagles goes to the west of New Hampshire, down through the Adirondacks and down into Pennsylvania. And that's the route that many of those birds follow. It's more inland than coastal. Um, but you might see a golden eagle flying right over New Hampshire seacoast heading south in, in this time of year. Um, it's really hard to say how many are coming through. It's probably hundreds that pass through, but they fly quite high. They don't stop for long and um, it's hard to track them. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hugh Mellard had a couple of questions, but he hasn't put them in the chat. Come on, Hugh. Hello. Hi, Hugh. Give up. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Chris. That is so interesting. Um, recently, there have been a couple of um, uh, publishing information about eagles and loons. There was an article in this latest uh, Yankee magazine called The Christmas Loon, and it chronicled some interactions between the eagle and the loons. And then there's also a local photographer who's been uh, publishing photographs of a loon family not far from here, I believe somewhere in Vermont. And he, oh, yeah. also, he also chronicled um, numerous interactions between mm -hmm. Uh, eagles and loons. And so do you have any any um, comments or interesting tidbits about loons? Absolutely. I have a number of comments and I'm not sure where to start. Uh, you're talking about the different articles, some of which are in popular things like Yankee Magazine. But I actually uh, worked with the uh, Loon Preservation Committee with John Cooley, who's their chief biologist. Um, and, and Hugh, maybe you could mute your... your uh, Thing, so we don't get feedback, but thank you. Um, we've actually chronicled the difference between eagles or loon productivity on nests, that, uh, on lakes that don't have eagles versus ones that do have eagles and looked at the difference when eagles move in, when territorial eagles move in. And we found that there's roughly a 3% decline in loon productivity uh, on lakes that have territorial eagles nesting. Problem is, the real troublemakers are, are, are the young eagles that aren't tied to a territory. You'll oftentimes see uh, immature eagles testing loons on a regular basis to see if they are easy uh, prey or not. And the bottom line is loons are rarely e easy prey. Um, and they all tell their friends, as soon as an eagle appears on the lake, the loons all start making noise and they tell all the loons on the lake that the eagle's in the area. And so loons and eagles have been together for tens of thousands of years. And uh, loons are quite well adapted in general to safing, safeguarding their chicks from, from eagles. That's not to say there isn't predation, there is predation. Uh, but l eagles are not the um, biggest factor in, in, in loon loss, that's definitely the case. But they are one additional factor that they have to contend with. Um, what months do eagle chicks hatch in New Hampshire? Eagle chicks hatch in March and April. 99% mm -hmm. of them do. Our earliest eagle chicks hatch as early as the, la the last week of March. Those eagle chicks, uh, those eagles were incubating in February for them to hatch in, in March. It's five weeks from start of incubation to hatch. Hmm. Um, so uh, if anybody else has any questions, I know there's something niggling in the back of your mind. Either throw it in the chat or get brave and, and unmute yourself and pop out a question for Chris before we go on. Hugh's got have, another one. I have one more. This is Hugh. Um, you mentioned the area around the Wilder Dam and uh, locations like that. Um, considering that downstream from the dam, the water stays open most of the winter. And mm -hmm. I, assume, I assume that that provides fishing um, habitat for um, the eagles. Not only fishing habitat, it provides a place where all the local ducks and geese go in the winter months and gulls as well. 
um, they all hang out on that open water. And um, the eagles, um, it's no accident the eagles have nested in that stretch for that reason. And it also gives eagles a place to go for open water. They bathe even in the wintertime. Oh. Uh, they need to get water. And uh, um, yeah, uh, they, uh, open patches near their nest sites are, are, are the norm for, for, for eagles. Um, are the leg bands color coded by state? Um, New Hampshire shares black leg bands with two other states, uh, Vermont and Connecticut. Uh, mm -hmm. The three of us have all used the same color leg bands. Um, Massachusetts for years used a gold leg band, but they ran out of combinations. And so they switched over to an orange leg band that looks a lot like David Karen's sweater. It's kind of an orange color there. Um, or Dudley Smith's sweater. <laughs> um, uh, New York State uses a blue band and uh, Massachusetts or Maine uses a red band. So that, that's a quick rundown. How long do the parents stay with their chicks to mentor them and teach them life skills? It's the chicks that leave first. The parents stay on those lakes and, and territories year round. The chicks um, sometimes stay into November. Other times they leave in August. It might not be a wise move to leave in August if you haven't gotten your, all your act together and don't have all your skills. It might be wise to stay with your parents a little longer. Mm -hmm. uh, but individual chicks from one nest, if there were three chicks in a nest, may all leave at different times. They don't go the same places. We put uh, bands on uh, several eagle chicks um, from one nest and they went to three different locations um, in, in Virginia and Connecticut. I'm trying to remember where the third one went, Pennsylvania, I think it was. So mm -hmm. they all have their individual plans. Uh, Rich Howarth on our board um, has commented a couple of things. He lives right next to the third reservoir on in Hanover Center Road and, he, and there's a loon pair that nests um, in, that, in that reservoir. And he says the loon alarm definitely does go off whenever eagles are in the sky. Of course, we know what loons do when small planes go overhead. Mm -hmm. uh, but Same also, uh, Rich points out that it's common for eagles to feed on, feed on deer carcasses that have been brought down by coyotes. Um, another question from Christine, what is the national range of eagles? How far south do they go? You said they're up into throughout Alaska. How they, about how far south? These guys, these guys are all over North America. Um, from the edge of the taiga, where the trees disappear in the north, all the way down to Florida. To um, the, in fact, eagles in Florida nest this time of year. They're they're beginning to lay eggs now hmm. because it's the coolest time of the year. They will fledge their young in March or April, and uh, uh, before it gets really hot, and Actually, some young eagles from Florida will migrate north after they leave their nesting area and hmm. come to New England or even to the maritime provinces. And that really is confusing when we see young eagles at the wrong time of year flying around in, in our area. They don't, again, troublemakers because they don't belong on these local territories, uh, but they're happy to get a, 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 loon, a loon or a merganser as a meal. And so those can be, um, those rogue eagles can be um, real, real trouble. Uh, Kathleen wants to know how far back from the water can eagles nest? Yards, dozens of yards or more? It, 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 it varies quite a bit. Um, the majority of our eagle pairs will nest within a hundred yards of the lake or river shoreline, mm -hmm. but it depends on the situation. It depends on uh, what the arrangement of trees are in the area. It's extremely rare. We don't go looking for eagle nests on ridge tops because that's mm -hmm. not the kind of place they usually end up. Um, usually within 500 yards of the nest, there will be water. And in fact, we always, when we search for a nest, we're starting on the shoreline and, and islands and going from there. Okay. And what do they normally eat and how do they get food? Um, it's they're generalists, as I said before. They eat all kinds of things, 
both dead and alive. And uh, I've seen him trying to open up a snapping turtle to try to get into the inside of the snapping turtle. It's not good for the turtle, believe me. <laughs> but it's tough on the eagle too. I mean, how do you how do you grab onto a a, a carapace? You know? Yeah. So they they eat a wide variety. Along those lines of being scavengers, are there still issues with the eagles with either lead from bullets or shot and fishing um, gear? Are there still issues with that? There absolutely are. In the case of fishing tackle, the same initiatives that work for common loons that the that LPC has been so um, upfront with to try to convince fishermen to use non-lead fishing tackle. Uh, that, that's, that would help eagles tremendously if, if people would just do that. It's been a tougher sale to the hunting community that uses lead in their ammo. And it's also a risk to both bald eagles and golden eagles because if, if lead shot in a deer ends up in a deer that dies in the woods and isn't retrieved, that then will be scavenged and that lead will go into the scavenger. Um, and, and that, so lead toxicity is a real issue um, with, with both bald and golden eagles. And uh, the only way we can change that is to use non-lead alternatives. I think our last question is from Carol, uh, who saw an eagle on Canaan Street Lake this summer for the first time. Uh, do you know of any nesting pairs? What was the name of the lake? Canaan Street Lake. Canaan Street Lake. Yeah. No, but it certainly is a possibility. We're not aware of a pair nesting in, in Canaan right now. Mm -hmm. I assume just, that's where that is. Just north of Mascoma. Okay. Uh -huh. um, Canaan Street Lake in Mascoma. No, it's north of Mascoma Lake. Okay, but is it in Canaan? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's a. I know there's a good lake right along the side of the road there. Um, it's suitable in size. We haven't documented them, but remember, our population is growing by uh, close to ten pairs a year right now. They could be the newest pair. So um, keep see, keep watching them. See what see what they're doing, and uh, let me know if you're seeing stick carrying or a pair sitting near what looks like an eagle nest. Great. Thanks Thank a lot, everybody. So I really much. appreciate your your attention oh, tonight. Wait, we have to ask this last question because Erica brought up something that's near and dear to my heart. Is there a pair of nesting on the Connecticut River near the Al Papa Music? We, we, we could do this all night, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, but this one, I need to know this because I, I'm going to say this. Flying over me. I, yeah. I could use your help, folks. Um, we have been seeing adult eagles near the mouth of the Al Papa Music for several years now. We have not documented a nest in that vicinity yet. It could be on the Vermont side. It could be on the islands up the river there. It could be tucked oh, on the other side of Route 10 on the New Hampshire side, where that big pine slope is near a river road. It, it could be anywhere in that. It could even be down by the Dartmouth College campus on, in those big pines. But so far, we haven't found it. And uh, that is, uh, that's the reason that I always look for input from the public about what they are seeing you know so get out there and have a look and maybe we can find these guys okay so we got a mission yeah thank you chris this was extraordinary thank you thanks so, so very much. much i hope you have a great rest of your meeting take all care right. i'm going to go all right good luck to you all right bye bye um we are back here now and we're going to um continue with our annual business meeting. And uh, I did want to point out before we get to our um, uh, to our minutes and, and the uh, the business businessy part uh, that we have uh, a new board member emeritus whom you've recently heard from. Uh, this is Hugh Millert. And uh, Hugh is is one of those extraordinary people. Um, he's on. He's been on our board for uh, I think 2008 to, to 2018. Um, was made an emeritus board member this summer, and we surprised him with that announcement uh, in just in August. 
Um, Hugh, I think, is on <clears throat> every single committee uh, that we have. The program committee, he's on our uh, community engagement committee, key member of our lands committee, and also a very valuable member of our stewardship committee with his deep knowledge of land management. Um, you can see here on, on the lower left here, he's installing the plaque for Bob Norman at the Norman Overlook at our Mink Brook Nature Preserve. I know many of you must have been out in the woods on the trips that Hugh has led. Uh, he's uh, especially the, his very favorite one, the moonlight snowshoe trip in the Slave Brook watershed. Um, Hugh is really um, a dedicated community servant all the way around. He's vice chair of the Hanover Conservation Commission, and he is also chair of its trails committee. And every time you turn around, if there's a need on a trail somewhere, no matter whose it is, um, uh, he was there to solve the problem. Gail McPeak is our other emeritus board member. Um, Gail was on our board for a number of years and was made emeritus last year. Uh, she's a wonderful educator. She's a wildlife biologist, uh, leads our Balch Hill um, hawk watches, and it was her inspiration to come up with the Hanover Trails Challenge, which is, I think, now in its ninth or tenth year, and invites families all over town to discover some of the lesser known trails and destinations in our community. Um, she's there at Fall Fest. Uh, she's come up with story walks. Um, Gail is, is a boundless enthusiast for getting people outdoors and appreciating the things that she loves so much. She's an essential member of our community engagement committee and also of our development committee. And we do need to acknowledge the fact that uh, this last year we lost our other uh, emeritus board member, Bob Norman, who was one of our founders back in 1961. He served on the board from that time until 2009 when he finally stepped off the board and became our emeritus member. Uh, Bob died on uh, June 27th. And you see here in the center of this photograph, we took at our 60th anniversary celebration last October. Uh, there are five Conservancy board, member, board presidents in that photograph, along with um, all the others, the current and former members of our board of directors. Uh, we miss Bob deeply, um, but he certainly has, has set a mission for us to follow. So now we'll turn to the minutes of our 2021 meeting. And I'm going to post them up here on the slide, uh, but Heidi will guide us through them. Hi. Okay, so this is kind of the most, one of the real businessy, boring items that we will do on this uh, meeting. But we're going to run through the minutes and ask um, for a vote to approve the minutes. And you'll see that vote in a Zoom uh, pop up voting window. Um, so, uh, just to recap, you can see them in front of you, but to summarize, we had the meeting on November 16th, 2021. We opened it at seven o'clock and approved the 2020 minutes. Treasurer Ryan Johnson reported the organization to be financially stable with an increase in assets of 279,299 in fiscal year 21, including a bequest from longtime member Robert Christie. Investments stood at that time at 1.47 million and were overseen by our finance committee and managed by Mascoma Wealth Management. The treasurer's report was accepted. We noted that we had a new program coordinator, Marilla Harkoff, who is here with us tonight, replacing Courtney Dragoff and announced that Gail McPeak had been appointed an emeritus member of the board of directors. I thank the outgoing members at that time, Jill Kearney Niles and Patrick O'Hearn and introduced our nominees, Mark Hiller and Russ Muirhead who were unanimously elected to the board. Executive Director Adele Mulligan did the program, illustrating the highlights of our 60th anniversary year, including partnerships with the town and the Trust for Public Land at the Mink Brook Community Forest. Um, let's see, we had a celebration there on October 2nd, uh, we then, of, of 2021. We explored the history of Hanover properties, that the Conservancy had protected and include, concluded with a review of high points of our new strategic plan, the promise to protect. We also interspersed that with a series of trivia questions. 
and the meeting adjourned at 8.20 p.m. And so now I am going to call for a motion to approve these minutes, but I cannot see everybody, so I don't know how I'm gonna, let's see. Um, okay, I see Erica Van Sitter's motion to approve, seconded by Russ Muirhead, and we are taking minutes now. So you, so you should see the motion. And all Conservancy members can vote. And we'll just give it give that a second for Marilla to let me know if people have if the votes have come in and if the motion passes. Okay, yes. Thank you. The motion passes. Um, okay, now I'd like to pass it over to Russ Muirhead, who is going to be doing our treasurer's uh, report. Thank you. Um, I am substituting tonight for Ryan Johnson, who is the actual treasurer of the Hanover Conservancy. Um, he's unable to attend um, this evening. Um, and as you know, the Conservancy carries out its mission with funds from our members' contributions, supplemented with investment income, support from local businesses, and grants. We're a not-for-profit 501c3 organization, which means that contributions to the Conservancy are tax-deductible under the law. The Conservancy's Finance Committee meets periodically to review the finances of the organization and to set financial policies and procedures for the organization. Our investment portfolio consists of both restricted and unrestricted funds, and it's managed by Mescoma Wealth Management according to investment policy and guidelines that are approved by the board. The Conservancy contracts with an independent CPA firm that specializes in accounting for land trusts. That firm pr provides the conservancy with a financial review and also with um, an IRS form 990, which is always available at our office on Lime Road and may be viewed there. Our organization is on solid financial footing. Our assets grew over the past year um, and here I'm, I'm the, by year referring to the year ending, the end of our fiscal year, June 30th, by $358,000 and uh, $358,175, which included a very generous bequest from a longtime member of the Conservancy. Our investment portfolio was $1.83 million um, at the end of our fiscal year which compared to $1.47 million at the end of fiscal year 2021. That growth was driven primarily by an increase in donor contributions. At the moment, as you know, market conditions are challenging. They have been throughout this calendar year. Our cash management is such that we don't depend on unrealistic expectations for our equity portfolio. And we're prepared psychologically and financially for inevitable down markets. Like all investors, we expect a higher return on our equities in the portfolio than from other investment interests, precisely because we know that equities can be volatile in the short run. Our uh, summary of our financials um, can be found in the annual report, which was recently sent sent to, um, to all the households um, in, in Hanover, in addition to all of our members. And with that, um, let me just pause to see if there are any questions. And I'm going to rely, let me see. I, I can't see everybody just because of the nature of the gallery view. I'm grateful um, that there are not any questions because now I think it's safe to confess that I am incapable, it's very likely of answering any questions. I might have had to just um, bookmark your thoughtful questions for um, the next appearance of Ryan Johnson at one of our meetings. So thank you for your kindness 
And with that, let me end the financial report. Wait, did we need to um, approve? I think we need to approve the treasurer's report. I think we do too. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So I move that we approve the treasurer's report. I see that seconded by Ann Malenka. And then everybody will see the vote there. Okay, great. Um, the motion passes and we approve the treasurer's report. So it'll be reflected and uh, you can all hear about that in next year's minutes. <laughs> okay, so um, here this, uh, as you well have seen in your annual report that hopefully arrived in your mailbox, um, this is our current board of directors um, and we're all listed there and it's just really a pleasure to serve with this board. And um, I can't say enough about our board and our emeritus board members and the hard work that they, everybody is doing for the organization and for our community. And I'm so grateful to be on this team. Um, and our staff members are not um, pictured here, but you'll see Adair and Marilla here on this, on your Zoom windows, and they really are uh, get all the work done. So we have two board members that are departing this year, and we are so grateful for their service, um, Dudley Smith and Karen Geiling. And I cannot say I will not attempt to say everything they have done, but we are incredibly grateful. Um, and most recently that includes Dudley co-chairing our stewardship committee and Karen, our development committee, and their contributions have been really invaluable to the organization and we will miss them so much. So we are sad to see them go and thank you for your service, Dudley and Karen. Um, and with, with those two departing, we have two spaces on the board and we have two excellent candidates. Um, these candidates have been put forth by the board. The board has uh, nominated and voted unanimously to support their um, uh, nomination to the board. And that is Martha Beatty and Xavier Gonin. And I do believe that you may also have gotten an uh, I don't know if we have any other description of their, their qualifications. They're eminently qualified to serve on our board. And we are very, very pleased to welcome them to the board service starting in January, if, if all goes well at the vote tonight. Um, so I think we will take them. Marilla, do we have it set up for two separate votes? Yes. Okay, excellent. Who is first? Uh, Martha Beatty is first. Okay, so do I have, so the board has already um, put them forward. So we can, I'll just call for the vote of the members um, to, uh, to, oh, here, you'll see it. Do you approve the nomination of Martha to the Conservancy Board of Directors? Votes are coming in. Okay. Excellent, the motion passes unanimously for the minute. And the second one, Xavier. So everybody can please vote. Excellent, the motion passes uh, unanimously as well. Thank you everybody for voting and for participating in the business end of our meeting. I believe, I'm just co confirming on my notes so I don't leave any business um, pending for the remaining year. I believe that captures all of the business that we needed to accomplish tonight. Is there a mm -hmm. thumbs up? Okay, great, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you everybody. Thank you Dudley and Karen in particular. We will miss you and um, thank you everybody for participating tonight. If you'd like to stay, first of all, if you have any questions, you can stick around. Um, but also we have a video. Uh, we're very excited to show. If you haven't seen it yet, it's also available on our website, um, but it celebrates our 60th anniversary and it was put together by a wonderful Hanover High School student, um, Ezra McGinley Smith, and he's just did incredible work. We're, we're so lucky that Ezra did this for us. So if you're interested, uh, please stick around or check us out on YouTube. All right, I'm gonna share my screen.
And actually, I think before we start the video, um, I'm going to um, move to adjourn the meeting so that, that we can reflect that in our minutes. That, um, so all in favor, or seconded by Ann, and then all in favor, I think we can just try a show of hands unless we have a poll for this. Okay, so the motion passes. So just to let the minutes reflect that we adjourned the meeting at 828. Thank you, everybody. Alrighty. Um, and you could just let me know if you can hear, that would be great, the sound. Can everyone see the video? Coming through fine. I never get tired of this view. It's so beautiful. And you'd never know we're just a mile from downtown Hanover. Balch Hill has long been a special place in this community. Even before the 10 acres at the summit was protected by the Hanover Conservancy in 1970, this is a place that people came to go blueberry picking, uh, to enjoy the views of Killington and Mount Escutney and, and Baker Tower down here below. The landscape was quite a bit more open at the time. It was pastures, meadows, uh, small orchard, but people loved it. And this is even where the Dartmouth ski team practiced skiing in the 1920s. When we moved to Hanover in 2004, we were delighted to find this marvelous natural area practically in our backyard. When we learned how and why this area was protected, um, we both became involved in the Conservancy and uh, have been active with them ever since. Not long after the Conservancy acquired the 10-acre summit, a developer proposed constructing more than 100 condominiums on the land immediately surrounding it when the town rejected that, they proposed 49 homes. That's when folks came together to protect the rest of this special place. The Hanover Conservancy, in partnership with the town and many, many neighbors, led a fundraising campaign to purchase the land for conservation, creating the Balch Hill Natural Area. Our story begins at town meeting in 1961, when Hanover adopted its first zoning ordinance to guide responsible growth. The new ordinance was based on a consultant's report that included a proposed greenbelt of undeveloped land around the downtown. However, town officials at the time chose not to include this part in the warrant articles. That very day, five concerned citizens, Bob Norman, Carolyn Tenney, George Wrightson, Ted Hunter, and Jean Hennessy, met to see what could be done to correct this omission. They believed protecting a green belt was critically important. The next year, they were back at town meeting with a petition to add a new type of zone, Nature Preserve, which won strong approval by voters. It was this group of inspired, determined citizens that formed the private nonprofit membership organization called the Hanover Conservation Council. Over the last 60 years, the Hanover Conservancy, as we are now known, has helped protect nearly 2,700 acres. This includes 453 acres all over town that we own and manage, plus 555 acres protected by our conservation easements or deed restrictions. With the Conservancy's help, another 1,664 acres have been acquired by the town and other partners for conservation purposes. Here we are at Lower Slade Brook, which is named in honor of Jim and Evelyn Hornig, who recognize the importance of conserving this really beautiful natural area in Hanover. Jim was our board president for the Hanover Conservancy and served on the town's planning board and also was a professor of environmental studies at Dartmouth College. We love it at Slade Brook. We love the trails. It's one of the closest ones to our home and we come all the time. I love how the trail is so accessible and I love seeing it over the seasons or in the summer we go to Slade Brook to enjoy the water. As soon as you get in the shade you can feel it cool down and it's a really nice break from the summer heat. This 
This is Mink Brook. It's Hanover's largest stream. Its watershed reaches from its headwaters on Moose Mountain to its mouth at the Connecticut River. Some remember how polluted the lower reaches of this brook and the Connecticut River had become by the 1950s and 60s. It wasn't until the Clean Water Act of 1972 and the construction of the sewer line through here under the Quinn Trail that the brook began to recover. Even more, it's been a deeply important place for indigenous peoples for thousands of years and continues to be so. The Conservancy recognizes and honors the Abenaki as the traditional stewards of this landscape. And we strive to respect and protect our conserved lands and waters here in a way that reflects that understanding. Conserving land comes the responsibility of watching over these lands forever. We use land trust best practices to prepare management plans and keep them up to date. We monitor boundaries, maintain trails and signs, and where needed, remove invasive species and restore native vegetation. This is a big task and requires a dedicated stewardship fund and a core group of awesome volunteers. Caring for our conserved land is a great way to engage the community and have local volunteers join us in our efforts. And we're very lucky here in Hanover that we have a lot of volunteers. They do such things as lay out trails, build trails, monitor trails, maintain trails, remove invasive species as um, Earl have mentioned, and also build bridges and do whatever else comes along. We're very lucky to have their help. With major trail projects and after storm cleanups, we partner with the Upper Valley Trails Alliance and rely on their expertise to help out. Our founders knew that getting people out on the land to learn about Hanover's re natural resources would go hand in hand with efforts to conserve them. They began offering guided hikes and bird walks and that program has continued and grown over the decades. Now hundreds of participants of all ages get outdoors and explore with us every year. My involvement and introduction into the Hanover Conservancy began when I brought my children on one of those trips. I then became a member and a volunteer and later went on to lead lots of field trips and served on the board for nine years. As a wildlife biologist, uh, being involved and supporting a local conservation group like the Hanover Conservancy was a real meaningful way for me to give back to the community. I've been involved with the Hanover Conservancy for 20 years and have led more than 50 trips. Particularly popular are our winter snowshoe hikes and people really like our annual moonlight snowshoe hike on Slade Brook, on the trails around Slade Brook in rural Hanover. Natural and cultural history are also included into our programs, telling the story of Hanover's past and how settlements shape the landscape and resources we have today. Teamwork has always been the best way to get conservation done. And our favorite partner from the time we began was the town of Hanover. Over the years, we've uh, worked to help protect a number of pieces of land in town with the goal of having it become town property. That was the case with the Tansy Tract back in 1966. And fast forward all the way to today here at the Minkbrook Community Forest and Greensboro Road. And, and you know, as the small town of Hanover, we don't have uh, a lot of resources to work on land conservation, acquisition, land planning projects the way larger communities do. This is a town that relies on really important partners in many facets of what we do. And when it comes to land conservation, um, recreation land planning, um, it's, the, it's the Hanover Conservancy and the Makebrook Community Forest property, which is a beautiful piece of property, in particular as an example of how valuable this partnership is, because Adair and I, together with JT Horn from the Trust for Public Land, have been working on this project for a decade. So without you all, we wouldn't have 
all the wonderful spots that we have and we're so grateful and and willing to step up to say we need partners in this in these um, projects and the conservancy is that partner the climate crisis is affecting hanover now and it's going to take all of us to confront it the hanover conservancy is helping by conserving stream corridors and wetlands to protect against flooding from heavy storms protecting cooler higher elevation habitat and linking with other protected lands to guarantee room for wildlife to move. Good examples are our Moose Mountain lands, the Mayor Niles Forest, the Britton Forest, and our purchase of a conservation easement on the 313 acre Shumway Forest along the spine of Moose Mountain. We also protect places important for other reasons, public drinking water supplies, historic landscapes, beautiful views and trails. Our new strategic plan describes our promise to protect. New important lands, the lands and trails already in our care, and our community's long held conservation ethic. That's a big job, but I think our community deserves it. Thank you, Hanover Conservancy. For protecting habitat for wildlife. For your promise to protect our land, trails, and community. For caring about the health of our community for places that I can connect with nature, for clean brooks and vernal pools, for beautiful trails to explore. And thank you to all of our members who support our work and make conservation in Hanover possible. Thank you. Okay, I think I realized we're still recording. I was like jamming along to the credit music there.